I don't believe there's two sides to a story. I believe there are hundreds of sides to a story. A variety of viewpoints. It is essential for your critical thinking skills that you listen to people. With all viewpoints, not just what you believe. Otherwise, you're just reinforcing your own stuff. And that might not be 100% accurate. And I couldn't have said it better myself, really. Welcome, guys. Hope everyone's doing well. Living their best life. And today I was curious to how do you relax and research? Where do you go to escape the hustle and bustle that is reality, unfortunately? You know, I, I live in my own little world. It's no lie. And, you know, any second I get to myself, I'm always daydreaming about past times where how it would have been to live in era in like this when these were buildings and not just remnants of their former self so i tend to escape anywhere i can find research on the topic of tartaria or the old world or ancient history and not ancient aliens style ancient history. I'm sure we've all been there before in this journey. But it's so common nowadays. Everyone, all the cool kids are researching, you know. And I love it because when I felt like I was on the hill by myself and there was no other truther in the world. I'm not going to lie, coronavirus, if it's done anything, it's definitely brought out the best in people to start researching and questioning and challenging everything, which is perfect. But let's get into today's video, which sort of was inspired by a chat room. <laughs> um, I love this channel, Chalk Body Outline. My boy Drew, he has uh, live chats every couple of days and I recommend you come along it's so much fun we hang out there's probably about 400 of us now after uh, quantum of conscience gave Drew the shout out and now it's up to around 500 that join in the chat open-minded people it's fantastic so pop along if you like that sort of stuff and in that chat we were talking and I found out that a lot of people, a lot of the truth community live in Colorado and it made me think about the this post here when I saw this and it, you know, uh, his name was Spetty Tigetti, I think that's how you pronounce it, it was saying you gotta check out Colorado, there's just so many anomalies and I agree after looking into it. So this post here by Angie Dragoon dragon she's talking about this guy right here which is the Baluchitan, Baluchistan Sphinx in Pakistan so let's read about it what do the Hingal National Park in Pakistan Shanku Canyon in Iran and the Grand Canyon in Arizona have in common some of you have already heard about the Baluchitan Sphinx Colorado Canyon Sphinx, etc. Natural rock formations carved by wind and rain. Yeah, right. Officials, as usual, refuse to tell the truth. She's researched this a bit, and this is what she's found. Hingol National Park in Pakistan, Shanku Canyon and the Grand Canyon were actually magnificent ancient cities, which were destroyed by a weapon. Swipe. Catastrophic event known to us as destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and this has been coming up recently I've noticed in probably two or three channels and uh, I think Campbell uh, The day that I I read this and then Campbell done a video and sometimes all the energy can focus on uh, on certain topics and events, you know and So I, I take that as a sign and I kept looking into it. So let's keep going which took place in 2024 BC. The truth is, 
Not only Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, at least there were five metropolis burned by the Teja Astra weapon only in that region. Actually, one third of the world was destroyed. Now, the Teja Astra, in my opinion, is another word for the Ark of the Covenant, probably the original word. In texts written about the Ark, they're very similar in description, um, in their capacity and, and what they can do. So, according to Sanskrit, the Teja Astra was an energy weapon which could produce a heat up to 2000 degrees Celsius. I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit, it's like 4000. In 2.4 seconds, it could cause calcification and petrify all organic and non-organic materials. It killed everything above and below. On the tablet number K5001 in Oxford, there's a translated text translated by Oxford not an amateur transla tra tra translator <laughs> and it says in the battle one of the Elohim called Ninurtu, Ninurta came to the mountain Mashu and released the first weapon of terror he cut the mountains Mashu top with lightning and melted the mountain in a second now that's pretty interesting because it's not like it's trending I think that slowly as we realize the lies uh, melted stone and destroyed stone cities is a hot topic right now everyone's looking into it and I, I feel like Wooden Nichols is on the right track months and months ago um, talking about melted cities in the desert and I think he then went to the Silk Road in the Middle East and uh, found examples of it there and, and here's more examples in my opinion of that style of look at this this is all formed by wind water and rain they say now you know using our discernment filter I mean this is a grid here and this is a sphinx like it's the sphinx and me like we have a very close relationship. It was, it started probably my truth journey back in the day when, you know, I was listening to NASA and also documentary channels that talk about aliens from outer space building Egypt and all this fantastic, and my imagination went wild, but as you get into it, you sort of realise it's not aliens. The, the people that built it are alien to us because we just have no idea who these people were. We've got stories. Yeah, Wikipedia have given us plenty of stories, but I don't believe them anymore because they're telling you that this is a natural formation. It, it, to me, this resembles Jerusalem or Egypt. And Egypt looks like a destroyed city itself. And such similar looking stone you know, this is stairs here, look, there's clearly steps here. Obviously, steps to the top, to the statue. And, uh, you know, a cataclysm, a catastrophe so large that it killed millions of people across the world has, I think, has happened, and that's clear. And I think that as a result, there was a torrential rain and a mud flood and, and storms, and in those storms, think about the lightning and how ferocious it would have been. So, I think when we have lashing water and ferocious lightning that we can't even imagine off the scale, it could destroy anything. And I think that this is what it would look like if it was just submerged in lightning, fire, somehow. This is what stone would do. Stone structures. So it got me thinking uh, about that chat room and everyone in the, uh, a lot of people in there from Colorado screaming bloody murder that there's just something going on in Boulder or in Colorado, which I'd never really looked into, but nothing will surprise me about 
Middle America and all its hidden secrets. So I took their advice and we're going to look into a little bit of it today. I've sort of only just really opened a bunch of links and I'm sure we're going to find some things that we could connect to, you know, what we've just read uh, in regards to that Sanskrit. And I think the first place we should start is a place called Flat Iron Mountain. And just going back to that Sanskrit and what Angie had recorded, it states, In the battle, one of the Elohim called Ninurta came to the mountain Mashu and released the first weapon of terror. He cut the mountain's Mashu top with lightning and melted the mountain in a second. Now perhaps the Elohim are giants, perhaps the Elohim are angels, perhaps the Elohim is a storm, you know, perhaps it could be anything. And, uh, you know, like Chinese whispers down the line, the story changes and gods and fire turn into gods and etc. So we can only interpret it our own way by really looking at it from every angle. And you have to wonder where these names come from. Flat Iron Mountain, I'm sure it's probably iron in there. But if you don't believe in the stories about earth plates and rotating, shifting, tectonic, rah-rah, then how do structures like this form? Because to me, it, it looks as if it's man-made some in some places, just like castles do. Uh, they look part of like part of the environment. As you have a castle and a mountain will be completely overgrown, and you know after five thousand years, this is what an overgrown structure would probably look like, and you can only speculate. But. To start with, I mean, Boulder, it's, it's a really strange looking, oh, Colorado, sorry, it's a, it's a strange looking landscape. Similar in some places to Las Vegas, and I, I'm not sure how close they are. I'm sorry, I'm, if it's right next door, I'm not sure. But just swinging through here, I mean, is it a petrified city? Who knows? The thing about this area is it does have places called, you know, the petrified forest. And I for one am one of those people that believe some mountains could be tree stumps. And you're probably thinking, you know, that's crazy. And I, I thought it was crazy too until I saw it really. And it was I saw it after Roger had pointed it out on Mud Fossil University. Um, and it was really hard to fathom a tree turning into stone. But that's what it does. It's simple as that. I found a log at the back of my house a couple of years ago. Uh, sorry, at my mother's house. And it was like it had been cut like this by a, a bandsaw or something. But it was stone. But you could clearly see that it was timber. Just really old and fossilized. And I never knew that timber turned to stone. And, you know, when you're thinking, okay, but these are just being chopped down and <clears throat> they're just lying there in the desert, right? This is the petrified forest in Colorado. So, you know, what you need to realize here is this is not the tree stump. <laughs> what are you looking at? This is the tree stump, whilst my dial-up internet shows all its glory. Colorado was a part of something a very, very long time ago, and perhaps even a couple of times, you know, perhaps the first cataclysm took out all the trees, you know, and because I feel like this is the branch, the branches to this tree. This is not a tree stump. I mean, who's cutting down trees? Look at this area. It's desert. There's no trees out here to cut down. Not this big. And but if it was this big 
and they were miles apart. Would you believe that? Uh. So, Colorado. Let's keep moving. So, let's have a look if we can find some Tartarian style buildings in this ancient, mysterious town of Colorado. Seemingly in the desert alone. Far away from the east coast of America where everything kicked off they say in the narrative but you know maps that I've seen say that this area of America was this and this areas of north of Colorado were inhabited by giants and they were inhospitable and that's what you know 16th century map makers had stated you know on their maps it's not just speculation and you see it quite common it's quite common to see especially Cal california and north sort of just under Cal uh, canada they say that's the region of giants and that was around the 15th century so not that long ago because i say not that long ago because the history that's been recorded, I, I feel like history goes well, well, well back further than that. So obviously a town full of red bricks, which would make sense because it's all red out there. I'm colorblind and I can sort of see that, sort of, I mean, it looks like the middle of Australia. And here we're at the Four Corners in Colorado and a significant landmark as it's the only place in America where four states connect or touch really and on ley lines as well and that's the most interesting part because Ley lines. What is the secret with ley lines? Why do they represent such a mystery when it comes to perhaps energy uh, use, free energy use, and the ley lines of the earth being significant in that? Um, it seems that lots of structures were built on top of ley lines, especially cathedrals. Um, and I think you could go crazy just trying to work out what ley lines purpose were. I think that that's how you channeled free energy, that's my own personal opinion. And I feel like the ley lines were some way of, you know, connecting that energy from place to place. I can't prove that, unfortunately, but there's lots of theories that we need to take on board and filter out what we feel could be true and move on with our life. So with, oh yeah, here's the, uh, the Boulder University and it's a castle. To me, that's a castle, a red brick castle. Definitely made with bricks built, uh, constructed out in the desert there, same color. And was this a bustling, hustling hive of activity once upon a time before us? And after perhaps the huge silicon trees of the past, and in that gap, was there a civilization like that lived this way with magnificent architecture and free energy, perhaps flying around the world in hot air balloons and all the things your imagination can dream up. Fantastic looking building. Look at the size of this. Oh, did I say building? Mountain. Let's keep going. Colorado State Capitol. Pretty sure. Why don't we see who the architect was? Have we seen him before? Myers. That, that rings a bell. 
Let's see what else he did. Neoclassical, I mean, they're all... <laughs> all these American-born architects are Greco neoclassical architects. I mean, obviously, what else was there to do in 1832 but learn how to build buildings like they did in Rome in, you know, 12 AD? So let's see, let's see what he erected. The Texas State Capitol. The Colorado State Capitol. He also designed buildings in Mexico and Brazil. Favoured Victorian Gothic. Why? Why do you favour this when you're not from there? Because I know in Mexico and Brazil, South America has some of the most amazing Tartarian style buildings you'll ever see. And this is why I can't just go, okay, the Tartarians or whoever these people were, were European. And I'm not saying they were American. The, the only reason I stick to America a lot of the time is because the stories are so ridiculous and I, I find them interesting and I understand the language and there's no religious sort of paraphernalia to get in the way of, like if you go over the Middle Eastern stories, you have to really know a lot about religion and understand who's fighting who and what's fighting what and it's just, it can get really confusing. So. When it comes to America, why is there Tartarian influenced buildings in America if they only stuck to Europe? That's my question to people that the people that assume that the Tartarians are European only because you know there's buildings in Sydney that have this style of architecture, neoclassical, but a different style of neoclassical, almost more intricate, but not as large. You know, not huge columns like this, more intricate style stonework. And the same architecture can be found in South Africa, which really they're on the same ley line when you think about it. Those, those sort of, them in the lowest part of the Southern Hemisphere, like Australia is South Africa, and you see the similar architecture on the lower side of the hemisphere and similar architecture on the northern side. So it's like there was two or three or four different advanced civilizations progressing through architecture all over the world and not just in one country and not a small European nation, I'm afraid. And well, that's my opinion. And you know, I just don't think that we can nail down an answer right now because there's, it's the time that we're researching and realizing what we've been lied about. Look at this in Colorado, Louis Charles. It's incredible. If you think about the, the, the work that goes into this, this is like sandstone. Few moments later, one eternity later. And we're back. Okay, so I thought it was going to take me to that photo, but it brought me to a pretty cool site, actually. It's called Denverite, and it's historical, sorry, historic Colorado photos. The Louis Charles McClure's documentation of Denver's romantic city. And Denver is romantic, I agree. I never really knew it was. But look at this. If I told you that was in France or, you know, somewhere across Europe with a cathedral like that in the background, the snow. What? That's in beautiful Denver. So we'll read a little bit about this because it caught my eye. The year was 1893, and the World's Columbian Exposition, or the Chicago World's Fair, was opening its gates, beckoning Americans to visit with the elaborate white city. The temporary fairground architecture, built by the likes of Daniel Burnham and Frederick Law Olsman Sr., was a grand Parisian, styled city, the likes of which America had never seen kicked off an architectural movement known as City Beautiful that would soon make its way to Denver. 
And if it's not the news distracting me, it's Postman. And where were we? So this is obviously Chicago World's Fair. I've definitely looked at, into that. It's one of my favorite escapes. The White City, they called it, because they used this putty plaster mix they called staff which is absolutely ridiculous but this peristyle is obviously a roman style architectural classical you know colonnades double double colonnades both sides and would the people that went to the effort of building this structure just slap merry christmas on it and a few wreaths and a couple of dead Christmas trees. These were built by ancient people, not organised by a committee of government officials. All they did was put the price on the tickets. The Cheeseman Memorial Pavilion. What secrets does this building hold? Imagine this building could talk. It'd say, oh boy, can you, you know. This could have been built by the WPA. I'm sure they would say something like this. Let's see, circa 1910. Can we get any information? Perhaps we'll look into that one a bit later. These projects defined a new era in America, one marked by industrial fervor and new prosperity. That's how they that's how they sold it to us. You know, industrial era, prosperity, business. This is how they sold this to us, this false historic narrative. The people that built these buildings perhaps didn't build these buildings and I'm saying that we didn't even build these buildings I feel like there's almost generations of civilizations in this just one photo you've got the cathedral back here in a neo-gothic style architecture spires buttresses huge halls and glass windows and then you come to you know the state capital or Perhaps this is the Civic. One of these is the State Capitol, and one of this is the Civic. And a completely different style, with a dome, spired dome, and not bulbous, just uh, spherical. Not bulbous like Taj Mahal, etc. Sort of what I'm getting at. But just have a look at the columns. You can see here, it's enormous. The columns is almost as big as the cathedral spire so perhaps different eras and here's that cathedral I was talking about and doesn't it look familiar to a building in Europe look at the spires here this is the Cologne Cathedral and you could do I could do a video on the Cologne Cathedral in itself it's just a fascinating story and I perhaps will one day but the rundown is essentially this cathedral survived World War II okay and this whole city was bombed out it was completely destroyed completely destroyed all except for this building the Köln Cathedral of Cologne and the story goes is the pilots used the building as a benchmark to find the city which is a likely story but perhaps there was something more to this building perhaps under it you know we don't know because they'll bomb other uh, ancient buildings they had no problem bombing Verdun and all of its churches and buildings and they, you know they bombed that first in fact they bombed Verdun 
for four, like 40 days and nights non-stop. So there was something there that they want hidden, and that's my opinion, you know. I think World War One and World War Two were both fabricated to A, depopulate the Earth, and B, uh, erase a lot of historic narrative that people may question in the future. So, we'll move on to this cool site. What do we got here? The old Union Station, Wincoop Streets, opened in 1881. <laughs> this view prior to the 1894. So this building only not it didn't even last 20 years. After which a larger clock tower was added. What's wrong with this one? Is it too free energy for you? Had to burn it. Now, look, I mean, just the, the stonework that goes into this gate. It's so intricate, the ironwork as well. What's it say? The Strihi? Can't read it. But yeah, signs slapped all over it. Now, why do these people dress like this? Like a uniform, right? And this looks like recess. You know, everyone from this era just look a bit lost. They don't look like they're from there. It's such a mysterious... Oh, like, okay, and another thing. Here, this gentleman is clearly walking. This is in 1910. Now, this is off topic, but a while ago, I had a commenter telling me that there's no photos of the Civil War because you can't get action photos in that period. Okay, well, this guy is walking. Is he standing here for 40 seconds like this in 1910? between 1906 and 1910, he's walking. This is an action shot. So if this was a war, I could see a war going on. And that's just a little thing I wanted to say, like... Come on, let's think critically here. Think about all the lies you've been taught to believe that the Civil War happened. You really have to let go and, and think on both sides, look at it from both sides, and then come back and make a decision. It's cool to, to believe what the masses believe, but one day they're going to look like fools because the truth, it, you can't hide the truth. You just cannot hide the truth. It will always, always find a way. Look at the, this is like sandstone. So if this was sandstone, this would actually be one solid piece, right? Because these grooves have been cut out of this one solid piece here and really it's just is it all the way to the ground is it I mean these doors go into the ground doors are they doors or are they windows <laughs> I mean that's a that's a window this is the first floor and then this is the second floor <laughs> oh jeez and the photos backwards so, just to disorient you, maybe that little bit more. Or, they just forgot to flip it when they erased all the buildings in the background, perhaps, that soared over this building right here, and they just added some fake lines and a bit of vanilla sky. It's insanity, and it doesn't look like... It doesn't look like that we don't know what we're doing. It looks like we found it and tried to patch it up. Action shots. Then they just look out of place. You can always see the style of building that's going to catch my eye, and because it catches your eye too. It just you look at these structures and. And I feel like maybe, you know, a 17th century style Victorian 
architecture, <laughs> architecture. But then you get to here, and it's like Greco-Roman again, with columns and, and that roof there. I mean, what's on the roof? What's this pole? It's in exterior view of the International Trust. It does look like a big. Now this looks like this looks like buildings in Chicago from the 1800s. Uh, look up Edward Sullivan. Just do Edward Sullivan architecture, and they all look like this. And considering he was in, you know, ten places at once, he probably did this. It won't surprise me. Now, is anyone else surprised that all these buildings exist in Colorado? I am. <laughs> I did not... If you told me there was no cathedrals in Colorado, I'd believe that. Red brick cathedrals. Hmm? With the same very intricate style hall. I mean, this is not easy to do, this... One solid roof like this. All sandstone. What else can we find? So, I mean, this is obviously a mud flutter. And perhaps built after on top. The doorway's huge. Even stairs to get up it. Just a beautiful old city. I really do enjoy looking at Colorado, I gotta say, because it's all red brick. It's just got that look of ancient times of mysterious people. Another castle looking structure. Look at this one. Colorado State Capitol. Look at this thing. Exterior view of Denver County Courthouse. Denver County Courthouse is absolutely buried. Check that out. Check that building out. That's one of those, like, multi-roofed buildings with the... It's got all this style of geometric shapes, domes, columns, spires. And what possibly the, happened in Colorado centuries and centuries ago. And thanks to Spentagetti and I think Lucky Huskins and of course Be Smiley for recommending taking a look at Colorado. My name's Phil and this is Tartarian Zephyr. I hope everyone has a nice rest of your day or evening and I'll catch you on the next video. See ya.